world know that being heard via advertisements is the name of the game. AmpSquare.tv understands how important advertisement is and is proud to express that it's truly the only plugged-in internet television production company on the market. Amp2.tv live streams all their shows across all the major selling markets in the U.S. and abroad. Call them at 866-224-5422. The AmpSquare.tv library allows productions to be seen over and over again, making commercial platforms more usable. Call 866-224-5422. Toll free 866-224-5422. Amp2.tv. The first and only internet television network that's truly plugged in. 866-224-5422. That's A-M-P, the number two, dot TV. The opinions expressed on the following sponsored program are strictly those of the host, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of this station, its staff, management, or sponsors. Amp2.TV presents You and Your Doctor, teaching you to live a longer and healthier life. Proudly sponsored by All County Healthcare, where people are the heart of our business. All County Healthcare is a Medicare certified agency where one call will service all your home care health needs. For more information, call 954 717 7027 or visit our website, allcountyhealthcare.com. Now, let's get informed to living a longer and healthier life. Here is your host for today's show. It's local. Hello and good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. We have special guest, Dr. John Hirsch, Jonathan Hirsch, based out of Boca. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm great. Wonderful. So you're board certified in orthopedic surgery as well as sports medicine. Correct. Tell me about that. Well, sports medicine is really like a subspecialty, Uh treating athletic type injuries, but not just athletes, you know, really anyone who plays sports on the weekend or recreationally up until professional athletes kind of take care of all of that. Um, so it's an arthroscopic surgery, you know, minimally invasive type surgeries usually. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's fun. It's been something I've been doing for 20 years. So I imagine that your client base, your patient base is consisting of many ages. It's not just the yeah, older Yeah, my community. patients start in their adolescence mm-hmm. up until... 100 plus, especially here in Boca Raton. Yeah. You know, people are active into their 90s. Uh, right. Golf and tennis. And so it makes practice quite interesting. Yeah. And you have an extensive background in tennis, don't you? Yeah, I've been taking care of professional tennis players for over 10 years. We wow. Have, we have a tournament up in Delray every year that the men's professional tour has a uh, 10-day tournament. And so I've been the medical director of that for about 10 years. So that keeps me involved. Even during the year, we have so many professional athletes tennis players that live down here in South Florida, mm-hmm. when they pass through, you know, if they have problems, they'll come see me. And there's a lot of tennis academies around here that I'm involved with, uh, their players and, and students. Oh, really? Like which ones? Uh, the Macy Academy, Pro World Academy, Everett Academy. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of the kids come to see me for their, you know, different tennis problems. So you have like high school adolescents come to see you? Yeah, as well. I, I cover games at uh, St. Andrew's School, which is a local school. Oh, I know St. Andrew's, school. yep. Um, cover their football games, take care of their kids there. So that's wonderful. Um, yeah, that's a you know a portion of my practice is certainly athletes, and then just the general population as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So I I looked on your website mm-hmm. and I saw that you do all kinds of stuff: shoulder and elbow surgery, knee surgery, uh, arth- arthroscopy, arthroscopy, yes. arthroscopy. Yeah. yeah. So what what is arthroscopy exactly? Well, arthroscopy is doing surgery using a camera, or, or an all, also known as an arthroscope. So we have the camera inside the body, and then we're looking on a TV screen mm-hmm. while we're doing the surgery. So the camera affords us the ability to see small things in a large way, and then we can use instruments to do things through the camera. So it's it's kind of like a video game in a sense, yeah. um, that we're just doing things through tiny holes, minimally invasive. Um, so you can kind of do a lot. You can do a, really a lot through the camera these days. That's incredible. I um, wanted to know with the with the adolescents, at what would you say that it's it's advisable to tell them to come and see you before or if they're actively playing in sports, even though they don't have an injury? 
just well, kind I, of I as a preventative? I think at the beginning of seasons, um, having some kind of physical exam, either by myself or their pediatrician, um, to look for certain things. Uh, for instance, the heart. Um, having a good heart exam by their pediatrician mm-hmm. is important. Although rare, uh, kids can have murmurs, can have arrhythmias that can cause, uh, unfortunately, sudden death uh, in certain I've kids. I've seen it. I've seen you know, especially it. the tragic. football players in August, especially down here when it's 100 degrees and they're in football pads. And, um, you know, so just having a general physical exam, making sure they're healthy enough to participate. Mm-hmm. And from my point of view, you know, examining joints, range of motion, and really giving advice. Um, you know, a lot of kids have no idea the difference between, between being injured and being hurt. Um, and, and, and so some pain is okay and some things really... Well, now, injury. now I don't know the difference between injury and hurt. What exactly? Well, hurt is like, look, you play a sport and the next morning something hurts. Or you're having an achy body oh, part. And okay. Maybe not something soreness. serious. Soreness, let's yeah. say. But injured is truly something to be seen about, something to maybe stop playing. You know, probably 90% of the things I see can be cured by just stopping for a moment in time. Right. Uh, a week off from tennis, basketball, whatever it is. And down here in Florida, because there's really no off season, people can play tennis, yeah. golf, basketball all year round because it's so so nice out. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to figure out resting periods for the athletes is is a challenge. It's a challenge getting them to rest. <laughs> yeah, uh, especially the competitive tennis kids yeah. that I see. Mm-hmm. You know, they always have a tournament coming up. They always have something they deem extremely important. Um, but I use the professional athletes as an example. Uh, Roger Federer, for example, just took off nine months or more last year, came back and has won two major championships, you know, taking off nine months. So you can take off time and still be successful. And that's just trying to introduce that into the kids' lives early on and understand how to recognize when things are wrong. Yeah, that's great. I agree with you 100%. Um, So when somebody comes to visit you for, let's say, they have a true injury um, what is what is a visit to your office consist of exactly? What should they expect? Well, I think they can expect my time and my ability to listen. I've always considered myself an excellent clinician, diagnostician in a sense that, you know, I, I think that most of my patients, I can help figure out what's wrong with them without all the fancy tests. Although we do order x-rays, we do order MRIs when we need them. You know, I think most of what sports medicine is, is examination and listening to your patients. And I do hear my patients complain about other offices where they really kind of run through very quickly. The doctor never right. touched me. And, you know, I think in my practice it's always been, I will listen to you um, if that makes another patient have to wait longer, but everyone will get my time. Uh, That's great. I examine all my patients thoroughly mm-hmm. um, and try to make a plan together. I, I think it's important as a physician, even as a surgeon, uh, to be a good listener and, and to learn how to examine your patients. Um, you know, we went into surgery to do surgery, but more than often we're not operating. We're, we're in our office examining patients, and that's an art, and it takes a long time to learn that art. Yeah. How long have you been practicing now? A long time. Uh, probably about 17, 18 years. Yeah. Um, I've been down in Florida uh, for about 13 years. Yeah? And where were you before? I was in practice in Philadelphia for the first oh, part of my career. Was it Philly? Yeah, for Philadelphia, Nice. Yeah. So first part of my career was there, and then I moved down to Florida. Yeah. Yeah, it's great down here, isn't it? Yeah, it's a hard place to leave, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. got to love Palm Beach County. Of course. It's great. So what uh, what hospital are you affiliated in? What, what, where do you do your surgeries? Um, West Boca Medical Center. Um, they have both inpatient and an outpatient center. I spend most of my time at the outpatient center. Oh, okay. Where my patients, most of my patients go home the same day. Uh, so arthroscopy allows us to send our patients home the same day. It's you know what's again, the, what's the re- recovery time on that? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> it, it, it it totally depends on what it is. You know, it can be uh-huh. as simple as two or three weeks for like a meniscus tear kind mm-hmm. of surgery, to six months or longer for like a rotator cuff repair of the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, that takes quite a long time. I actually am struggling with a rotator cuff injury myself, so. I can relate when it comes to that, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm worried about the downtime for that, for the rotator cuff. Yeah, I mean, it goes in phases. I mean, there's some downtime that feels like downtime, maybe from sports and stuff, but you know, mm-hmm. people 
go to the gym and live their life right after surgery. I mean, yeah. they, they adapt. Yeah. Yeah. How long? How long can they get back, back to the to gym and their stuff? their active lifestyle, yeah. I mean, some people within two, three days are back running or in the gym or riding a bike. I mean, people who really are motivated, yeah. their arms in a sling, but they're doing what they can. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Let's see one of the benefits of living down in South Florida. Everybody's into fitness and health and you want to keep healthy. Yeah, so. I think the masses motivate everyone. I mean, they, yeah. people running down the road, riding their bikes down the road. I mean, it Everybody looks great. You. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean... It's, so some, it's definitely you're motivated to get outdoors. Yeah, that's awesome. So do you do the tennis? Do you do that outdoors mostly or? Yeah, I mean, tennis down here in Florida is all outdoors. Um, the tournaments that we have uh, are in February, so mm -hmm. it's a little cooler out, which mm -hmm. is nice. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some junior tournaments going on right now, which I, I don't know how these kids do it in 90 it's plus so degrees. It's so hot out there. Yeah. I couldn't imagine midday. Yeah, the Florida kids definitely have an advantage over the northern kids in these tournaments. Because they're used, they're to, used it, yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah, they're conditioned already. Exactly. That's great. So with uh, you have this uh, procedure that you're doing, and I don't really know much about it, so I'm going to let you educate us. Sure. Um, the subchondroplasty Correct. procedure. The, the sub subchondroplasty. Yeah. Yeah, subchondroplasty procedure is a nice alternative uh, for some patients with arthritis of the knee. Uh, and some other joints, um, there the bone itself becomes inflamed in certain processes. Arthritis is one of them, so mm -hmm. they get edema in the bone or swelling. And sometimes with arthritis, their their pain comes from the bone marrow swelling. Uh, so the bone itself gets sometimes like a stress fracture or a micro fracture. So we go in there um, through a small hole and we inject bone cement into the bone itself. Wow. Uh, so we're not treating the arthritis per se, we're treating the bone marrow swelling that some people have associated with their arthritis. And the bone pain goes away almost immediately. So this bone cement goes into the bone, solves the bone marrow swelling problem, and uh, we also do an arthroscopy at the same time and clean out the knee. Uh, and people are doing amazing. So uh, we, we only make this diagnosis on MRI, which is something we don't always do in the past with people with arthritis. We didn't really get MRIs because we knew from the x-ray, they had arthritis. But then we were discovering there's people who, whose pain just didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It was more than you would expect from the amount of arthritis they had. And sure enough, on the MRI, uh, it, it was a really bright signal of inflammation. And so some people actually in Philadelphia and, uh, and other places developed this system where very easily you can inject bone cement into the bone marrow swelling areas on MRI um, and get really amazing results. So their excruciating pain comes down. Other patients with just stress fractures from running we can treat uh -huh. without arthritis and other things like that. So it, it's been a nice procedure for certain people. They're not really ready for joint replacement, yes. um, but they're in pain that is really intense, and it's from the bone. Right. And do you find that this pain is brought on sometimes a lot by the, uh, the weather, the changes yeah, in the I air? Yeah, I mean, people say they can predict the weather, uh, the humidity change. Based on their pain. <laughs> but yeah, storms coming. Right. That's even after people we operate on. Like, you can fix a fracture, and years later, the patients can predict a storm coming. And mm -hmm. I guess it's the barometric pressure somehow they can sense. It's kind of a weird phenomenon. Yeah. But it, too many people have told me that it's that it happens, that it has to be to, true. Right, you some know? truth to it, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, there's not one person I know. I mean, obviously, there's people that I know, but... There are a lot of people that I know that have arthritis or suffer from arthritis, and they're like, oh, it's going to rain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I and can if feel that's it the, coming. If that's their only issue, that's that's pretty good because, yeah. you know, part of my job is, you know, teaching people how to live with arthritis mm -hmm. and, and getting them through their day. Um, some arthritis we can cure in very small areas with cartilage transplant surgery because um, arthritis really is loss of cartilage. So some people... Um, the, we can actually transplant and put cartilage back in certain places. That's great. I, I'm completely learning a whole bunch of new stuff here with Good. regard to arthritis. I thought it was inflammation. Well, yeah, that's that's where the itis comes into play, where really it's a misnomer. Arthritis really should be arthrosis, so it's the generation of cartilage is really what it is. Secondarily, people get inflammation, so um, it, it's kind of a bad name in, in a sense, but that's what we're stuck with. Yeah. <laughs> so we use it. That's awesome. So how how um, how many subchondroplasty procedures would you say you do weekly? I've been or? doing it for about a year or a year and a half. I think I'm over probably 30, 35 patients of 
sort of a mixed bag of causes of their of their problem. Mm-hmm. Um, you can also do other joints other than the knee, mm-hmm. uh, like the ankle, uh, sometimes the shoulder, but primarily I'm doing it. most of who I see needed is in the in the knee. I mean, I've had runners with stress fractures who I've cured with this. Um, people with advanced, really bad arthritis that we took a chance. They didn't really want a joint replacement, and they've done really well. Um, so and this is all nice, minimal. Minimal invasive outpatient procedure. That's great. Um, again, if the MRI shows they have this edema, they're, they're a candidate. If the MRI is kind of quiet and doesn't show it, then we have to move on to something else. You know, we do platelet-rich plasma injections in mm-hmm. our office for people with arthritis. What is that? I saw that on your website, and I wanted to know more about it. So this it. is a biologic procedure that we're doing for arthritis and also tendon injuries. So okay. let's say you have a shoulder problem, you have rotator cuff mm-hmm. tendonitis, or even just a small partial tear. We draw the patient's blood. We spin it down in a centrifuge, and we separate uh, the platelets and concentrated platelets uh, from your body Mm -hmm. and inject it into the joint. Uh, As it turns out, platelets, which are important for blood clotting and things like that, also have growth factors that bring stem cells and other proteins to areas of the body to promote healing. So it's a very easy thing to do in the office. Um, There's no risk involved. Um, And again, for arthritis... I think w- what we're seeing is that we're slowing the process of arthritis and people are just feeling better. Um, t- I have like, entire tennis clubs coming to the office with moderate arthritis, a couple of PRP shots, and a good nine months for a year. They're good to go. They yeah. understand it's not necessarily a cure, mm-hmm. but it's keeping them out there and happy. And is that something that insurance companies are paying for? Unfortunately not at this oh. point, no. Okay. Well, most of the biologics are all of the biologics, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's unfortunate that they're not. Um, mm-hmm. But we try to keep the price pretty reasonable, and, and mm-hmm. people have no problem with it. That's great. Yeah, I'm sure if you uh, if you really need it and it's an option, it's definitely something that you should explore. Yeah, I mean, if, if the option is being active or not, you know, most people are motivated to be active right. and uh, and try to get something that'll keep them there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how uh, when are you in your office? You have an office in Boca. I do. Right? Is that East Boca or West Boca? Um, Central. It's okay. uh, 18th and, and Power Line. Okay. So in the Boca Point area. So it's pretty much right in the middle yeah. of South, South Central, Boca. Um, <laughs> South Central, <laughs> yeah. Boca. Boca. Um, <laughs> And so it's pretty easily accessible to highways, and, and so it's, yeah. um, it's, a good, it's a good place. I know the area very well. I actually live in that area. Oh, okay, so, perfect. yeah, it's, you're next to everything. You're next to Sawgrass. You're next to Turnpike. You're next to 95. Correct. Yeah. It's just a really yeah, we have nice patients area. from all over, very you know, far north to very south. It's mm-hmm. not that hard to get to. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What are your hours there? Uh, I'm in the office, really, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a full day, like 8.30 to 5. Mm-hmm. Tuesday, I see patients a half day. Mm-hmm. Um, Thursday, uh, Dr. Weistein, I know you had it on your show in the past, mm-hmm. is in my office. He's a joint replacement specialist. So right. There's someone there every day. That's wa- that's wonderful. Um, how about your staff? Tell me about your staff. Um, we have three great ladies working in the, working in the office. Um, you know, I think having a small office, we can be really attentive to patients, answer their questions. Um you know, give attention that they need. If they call, they get someone on the phone as opposed to a voicemail all the time. Or an automated system. Yeah, so I think, you know, <laughs> we try to, it's small, so we try to keep a very personal family-like atmosphere mm-hmm. uh, that our patients get to know my staff, um, they get to know me, and uh, they come back. You know, they come back when they're, they're good for one problem, they come back for the next problem. And, and so we try to really, you know, keep people moving through the office as best as fast as we can right while giving them the time that they need sure absolutely. yeah what's the average amount of time would you say that you spend with uh with a consult you know a new patient you know most people at least you know usually 15 to 20 minutes mm-hmm. um for just a focus problem some people come with many problems and yeah. uh, we have I'm- to spend a half an hour together and and you know orthopedics a lot of it's ongoing you know you don't necessarily figure it all out on the first visit mm-hmm. um sometimes we need some testing and we they come back for more you know, some people come and then they've only had a problem for two or three days and we kind of let it bear itself out. Sometimes it just disappears uh, or sometimes it becomes something bigger. So right. um, it, it's an ongoing process. A lot of my patients that um, we're trying to figure out why they're in pain because that's pretty much what everyone comes in. Something hurts. Yeah. So it's a lot of the process of elimination. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So uh, so you you work with the hips as well, right? With the arthritis of the hips. Yeah, and, and for me, hip arthroscopy is mostly what I do. It, mm-hmm. It's something that I've been doing for several years now. 
Um, it's sort of a n newer, over the last five to ten years, um, where we're doing more and more hip arthroscopy. Uh, it, it's something that was difficult early on because to get into the hip joint with a camera is quite difficult, but now we have newer techniques. So we can do you know, really big repairs of a substance called the labrum, which is the lining of the hip. We can repair tears. We can remove bone spurs. There's really a lot you can do in the mm -hmm. hip. Uh, also outpatient procedure, um, just three, two or three little holes, and we do a whole lot of work in, in the hips. Not a lot of guys are doing hip arthroscopy, so um, it's something that people come in specialty uh, to see us. Um, yeah. With, you know, some people have had hip pain for years and nobody could figure out what was wrong with them. And, you know, we, we determine they have a labral tear um, and fix them. And people do. do How does do something really like well. that happen with a labral tear? It, it doesn't necessarily have to be intense sports or anything. It could be either. Um, certainly there are people who get labral tears from a one-time event, a slip and fall, a twist mm. on the court or even a car accident. And then others, it's just attritional over time, degeneration, um, the, the wear and tear of life. Yeah. And you, you take a, an MRI and sure enough, you see a tear. There are definitely people out there with a tear in the hip that actually don't have pain. Um, and those patients, we just follow and we don't have to treat necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but those that have symptoms, you know, do really well. And, and, and surgery more often than not is indicated if they have pain. Okay. So at what moment do you decide that it's probably a better option to do a complete replacement? That's for the arthritic patients. And, and those are the patients that I'll pass on to Dr. Weistein, mm -hmm. you know, the cartilage, the lining of the hip joint, when that starts to wear down, you take an x-ray, they're, they're basically bone touching bone. Hip arthroscopy is not for them. They've kind of missed that boat. Ah, um, and okay. now they need a replacement. Now that does re depend on their age and their activity as well mm -hmm. and their health. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people are getting hip replacements younger and younger because they're unwilling to wait, un unwilling to be in pain and not be able to do the things they love. So it's not uncommon to see someone 45 year old really? get a hip replacement. That's I surprising. Mean, with, with the techniques, you know, it can last over 20, 25 years. And if they have to get a new one in their 60s and 70s, people are willing to take that risk mm -hmm. so they can enjoy their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Right. So, you know, it, it's a case by case basis. Yeah. Yeah. How many of those do you think uh, your office does or Dr. Weistein? Um, Probably, you know, a couple hundred a year throughout wow. his practice. I and mean, he recently moved back here from California, um, where I don't know the exact number, but hundreds and hundreds of years. I recall. His, I recall. His surgery is mostly hip and knee replacements. Mm -hmm. That's what his yep. specialty is. So we really complement each other. Mm -hmm. I'm treating arthritis in a different way, minimally invasive, maybe injections, maybe minimally invasive surgery. And then mm -hmm. when they're too far gone, you know, then he takes over and replaces them. And we have patients that bounce back and forth trying to decide, well, what's the right for their specific problem? Yeah. Hi, Dr. Weistein, by the way. <laughs> Hope he's watching. <laughs> um, that's, that's great. Uh, I am a firm believer in uh, you are what you eat. So what foods do you, do you know because what, of what you've seen um, attribute to arthritic, arthritic inflammation and pain well, yeah, there's all these, you know, theories about different foods that promote inflammation in our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one of the biggest things is really just in general a healthy lifestyle of eating to maintain a normal weight. Um, yeah. That's what we concentrate. I certainly don't consider myself a nutritionist, but we refer to nutritionists, especially if they're going to get a joint replacement, because we really want them closer to their ideal body weight if they're going to have a joint replacement or a major surgery by myself as well. Because that weight, you know, really makes rehab rough and yeah. um, increases the complications. Yeah. Um, so, and sometimes patients need bariatric surgery, you know, if, when all else fails and they're 400 pounds and they really want to get their knees replaced or something like that. Um, because for every pound of weight, it's six to eight pounds of pressure on your knees. That's interesting. Um, so it's exponential. So, you know, I try to give my patients short goals, you know, uh, you know, 20 pounds over... A couple of months you know mm -hmm. just pick a number and then move on you know you, no one's gonna lose 100 pounds you don't want to lose 100 pounds that fast right um, but it's over a, time I and mean, it's a long-term goal and yeah it's, it's in a, a, health, a healthy way yeah in a healthy way to do so, it yeah you know the food you know they talk about diet plans and thing I always try to push my patients toward diet plans I'm gonna teach them how to eat properly mm -hmm. not do something quick you know you order some food and pre-made right. in, in the mail that you that is very un, un, distasteful 
Um, it doesn't get you on a pattern of eating healthy. You know, so something like Weight Watchers or something that's going to just basically take real food in, right, in the right proportions, I think, is a better option mm -hmm. for most people. I it's, think portion control is huge. Yeah. Huge. I really, I mean, I do eat fairly healthy for the most part. Right. Um, and I feel it when I don't. I feel it in my body when I don't. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Yeah. It's not I think uncommon. portion control, I mean, America in general, our portions are, you know, have always been traditionally large, especially at fast food places. That's putting it lightly. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, like that, that famous movie, was it Supersize It or something? Supersize <laughs> Me. Yeah, Supersize Me. I saw me. that. Yeah, scary, That huh? really changed yeah. my life. <laughs> yeah, guy got, I, I, you know, the guy got very sick, but, you know, he proved a point. Yeah. And um, so I, I think, you know, fast food is here to stay, but it's amazing the fast food companies have adopted, you know, they have salads now, they have grilled yes. chicken as opposed to fried chicken. And, you know, they've, they've come around a long way, mm -hmm. you know, probably not as much as we'd like, but they're definitely healthier fast food alternatives mm -hmm. now um, that because of people's lifestyle, they can't sit down to a restaurant, but at right. least they can grab something much better for them. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You see all these new health spots popping up everywhere. And it makes our, I mean, makes what I do easier. I mean, I have someone who tears a ligament in their knee and they're very, very overweight. That's going to be a challenging patient. Their rehab is going to be harder. Their risk of tearing the, te the, the ligament again is, is going to be higher. So right. we, we work Even together. going into surgery is not ideal sure. at that weight higher either. It's, it's a higher risk. Anesthesia, blood clots. Um, yes. You know, so we, we try our best. Some people can't lose the weight by the time they need the surgery, but mm -hmm. it's still something we work on you yeah. know, in the, in, after surgery if needed. How common is that for you? People being overweight yeah you know, in this country it's uh, very common even down know. here in Florida down here in Florida Philadelphia very much so yeah um, you know I think in Florida compared to Philadelphia it's a much thinner population mm -hmm. um, uh, you know people are out they're fit because just the weather you know so yeah. we, we're lucky in that respect but um, some people don't have the time to exercise and, yeah um, and, and look it's Guilty. something we're <laughs> yeah, all of us. So there's something we're sensitive to you know it's never you know, it's never, never a blame game. It's just, okay, how do we correct this problem? Mm -hmm. If it's a medical issue, you know, their medical doctor helps them, whether it's thyroid function, things yeah. like that. So um, it, it's, it's, it is another medical diagnosis, right? Obesity is a diagnosis. It, it, it's, it's something that has a cure in most people if they're willing to put their mind to it. Right. Yeah, it's mind over matter. Yeah. Very difficult to change your lifestyle after so many years, I'm sure. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. So what else did you want to talk about in regards to uh, what you do? What do you enjoy to do the most out of everything? Well, I mean, for us, for me, for, you know, surgery is, is something I, I'm passionate about. I mean, I went into orthopedic surgery to be a surgeon, to operate on mostly healthy people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you train, you know, surgery is what you do mostly. And then when you go into practice, the real life, seeing patients, talking to them is what you do more than surgery. So it's a it's a nice mix. I get to yeah. spend time with my patients, get to know them. Yeah. And, and surgery is, is really, obviously, the focus had been the focus of my training and, and the part I love the most. But, right. you know, it's a good specialty because we're, most, we're fixing a very focused problem. Um, you know, a broken bone, let's say. We yeah. go in, we fix the bone. It's very satisfying to watch it heal, watch the patient go from you know, a bed in a hospital where they were hit by a car, you know, the day before they were running marathons, break a leg, and then get them back to running marathons. So, you know, that's why I chose orthopedic surgery because mm -hmm. for the most part, it's getting people back to their functional life. Mm -hmm. doesn't always work out perfect, especially when someone has multiple problems from accidents, things like that. So right. trauma and fracture care is still part of my practice. Another part that I really love um, when people come to the office with complex fractures, uh, putting those back together is really an art that, um, that I think I excel at. So, um, you know, that's what attracted me to orthopedics to begin with was the trauma part. Um, training in New York City, we saw a lot of accidents and, and things like that. Where in New York? I went to NYU Medical School, and oh, okay. part of my training there was at Bellevue Hospital, which is where I first was introduced to orthopedic surgery. Uh -huh. um, it was a level one trauma center. We got patients flown in from New York City and the surrounding areas and saw stuff that, you know, really not many other places saw. Yeah, so I bet that even fed the motivation even more just to see all that action yeah. going on. Yeah, I mean, you really can have a major impact on someone's life. You know, they're um, one second they're healthy driving down the street, and then they're in, in unconscious in your emergency room. Um, a lot of our patients early, you know, when I used to work at trauma centers, you never even met them. They were unconscious, uh, and you you took take care of them, and they didn't. They met you three days later when they 
they woke up and like basically said, what did you do to me? You know, and, and for the most part <laughs> said, thank you. All you good know? things. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was an interesting perspective because you're operating on a person that you can't talk to. You you, you talk to their family, mm-hmm. but they may not actually be able to get to know you because they're you know, unconscious from a car accident. So that mm-hmm. was like my first introduction yeah. um, to orthopedics and thought, wow, you really make an amazing impact on a person's life who's just life was shattered in a sense. And that's where you decided that's what you wanted to do yeah, because of everything school. that you saw. Yeah, the trauma stuff really uh, interests me. Um, and sports medicine is sort of trauma in a sense where there are injuries sure. on, the, on the field, sure. but I still treat people in car accidents and other things like that. Yeah, and I'm sure with the sports, it's, it's really rewarding because you can you know, con- help an adolescent or an athlete continue in their journey towards that career or continue their career. Yeah, there's nothing more devastating than a high school athlete who's approaching, let's say, scholarship decisions and they tear, let's say, their ACL. And, um, That's rough. You know, we, we put them back together, we do their ACL surgery, but it's nine to 12 months before they can return to their sport. And mm-hmm. sometimes the timing is not right and it influences okay. you know, the college. All right, well, we have to go to break now and hear a word from our sponsor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yep, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you. County Healthcare Inc. is locally owned and operated, serving Palm Beach, Dade, and Broward counties for the last 25 years. The practice of medicine is changing dramatically. All County Healthcare Inc. still does it the old fashioned way, where our nurses and healthcare professionals come into your home to service your medical needs, providing you the fastest and best care possible. For more information, call 954 717 7027. And remember, Medicare Home Care is covered by Part A of Medicare with no out-of-pocket cost to you. It's your decision and only your decision on what health care agency you use. Call today, All County Home Health Care, Inc. at 954-717-7027. License 20099096. Getting older is not for sissies. That's what one of my patients says. And it's funny, but it's true. Live long enough and you'll get arthritis, skin cancer, probably one of the common chronic diseases like CHF, COPD, diabetes. At All County Healthcare, we teach you how to manage your disease. We make sure you know how to take your medications and how to recognize signs and symptoms before requiring hospitalization, no matter how many visits it takes. You didn't move to Florida to be sick. You moved here to enjoy the rest of your life. And that's exactly what our team of nurses, therapists, and aides at All County Healthcare help you do. You are listening to You and Your Doctor, Living Longer and Healthier, an informative show that helps you find answers to questions you always wanted to ask but did not have that somebody that could make a difference in your life. Call into the show if you have a question at 888-565-1470, and we will put you on the air to inform all our listeners. Now, back to our show. Hello, welcome back to our show, to the second half of You and Your Doctor, Living Longer and Healthier, sponsored by All County Healthcare, a Medicare certified agency. We broadcast every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. on 95.3 FM and 1470 AM. We are live streamed on All County Healthcare Facebook page and on their website. You can hear it again next Tuesday at 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. If you have any healthcare questions, please call 954-717-7027. Ask for Maddie and she'll be happy to answer any healthcare questions that you may have. For the second half of our show, we have... Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Frank Wittenberger. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. How are you today? I am doing great. Yeah? How was the drive-in? Not too bad. No? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. and you're at Florida Medical Center? We are. So, Florida Medical Center, you know, everybody, we actually, everybody drives past us. There are quite a a few uh, drive past us every day because we're right on the turnpike between Commercial and Sunrise. So everybody says, well, that's where Florida Medical Center yeah, is. That's so, the hospital. Yeah. Okay, so what what do you do there? What, what are your duties there at the... So I'm the chief medical officer. So mm-hmm. the chief medical officer is part of the executive team. And so I 
function in a number of different roles. I, but I primarily I work between the medical staff and mm-hmm. the administrative team and kind of work through the issues that that uh, come up uh, between with the doctors, uh-huh. and then also really focus on um, safety and quality issues for the hospital. So both with the risk management side of, of when the hospital has issues and also just kind of developing best practices, developing mm-hmm. policies that, that really help to, to put the hospital in the best position. That's great. That, I really do appreciate you making the time to come out today. Uh, Chief Medical Officer, I'm sure your schedule is very jam-packed. <laughs> sure, yeah, it is, it is. And, and so, you know, originally I was trained as a general surgeon, and so uh-huh. I was doing both for a long time, and I was a chief medical officer at a hospital in Dallas for a few years, and then oh, Texas. decided to just focus more on, on being primarily um, on the administrative side of things. What type of surgery? General, general surgery. General so. surgery, so trauma... Uh, I did do trauma initially and then primarily did a lot of breast surgery and uh-huh. abdominal surgery um, was the largest part of my practice, robotic surgery. Robotic surgery. Your practice, was it here or was it back in Texas? So it was, um, so I originally from Boston and, and oh, wow. uh, I trained at University of Massachusetts and uh-huh. then was in practice up there and did trauma surgery and general surgery and then um, moved to Dallas and did uh, primarily general surgery and then was in private practice for a long time. So I, I think that helps, you know, in terms of understanding the, you know, a lot of what the physicians go through and kind of their perspective. And that's why, you know, it's important to have physicians in terms of hospital leadership to, that can relate to what the physician's perspective is yeah. and, and how, because the, 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 Issues that drive physicians in terms of, you know, what motivates them and, and where their their alliances are are yeah. different than the hospital. And so really finding ways that we can align with the physicians yeah. and really work together in ways that are productive. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes you find that physicians will be, you know, doing what's, what is in their best interest and the, the, and the patient's best interest. And, so, and the hospital will try to do what's in the patient's best interest too. Yeah. But sometimes we, have, we get crosswise in terms of trying to work together and, and you mm-hmm. know, uh, you know, I think most people have an understand. You know, most people's perception is that that physicians are are work for the hospital, and mm-hmm. and really physicians are you know in general by and large, especially in Florida, are independent practitioners. Yes. And so even even uh, the physicians that are employed by tenant physician uh, services, they're independent of the hospital. So they don't work for us. So when people call and they say, well, you are their boss, mm-hmm. I'm not their boss, but I, you know, I'm like more like a colleague and a coworker. So we learn how to work together yeah. and, and, you know, really, like I said, learn to find ways to align and, and, you know, really we're all interested in the same thing, which is basically taking care of patients, right. getting good outcomes, having yeah. safe you know, a safe experience for patients yeah. when they're in a hospital. Yeah, I completely understand that. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that. They think, you know, the, oh, well, the doctor treated me at this hospital. This is where I'm going to call the hospital. Right. I recruit physicians by day. So I know mm-hmm. for a fact they don't work directly for the hospital unless they were hired directly from the hospital. Right. There's So there's, there's actually laws called the corporate practice of medicine. And so in... Certain states like Florida, mm-hmm. there's there's laws against corporate practice. So, which means that basically, you want your physician to do what's in your best interest, not what's in some corporation or or um, you know a big hospital group's uh, interest. So, they basically have always had laws to to keep physicians so that their decision making is independent of what what uh, what. Uh, the hospital, you know, they won't do things just because the hospital wants them to. And, you know, which sometimes that's where we sometimes get into difficulties because, you know, again, we have to work together and we have to kind of work things out. So So that's what you do. You're the, you're the liaison. I am a mediator, (laughs) a liaison, (laughs) you know, and, and and like I said, it helps having been in practice for a long time on my own and and then, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to be able to, um, take that experience. And then, you know, along the way I got my MBA too. So kind of to have that business background yeah. too, to, to bring all that to the table and, and really, um, you know, I think it helps, uh, kind of for us to find common ground. Yeah. That's amazing because you, you're, you, you are like the co cohesive <laughs> between the hospital and the, uh, the physician and your background in medicine is very helpful. I'm sure to kind of understand 
where the providers are coming from. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, in general, you know, general surgery is a specialty that's very kind of hospital based. A lot of, a lot of, you know, people end up being chief medical officers or either ER doctors or internal medicine doctors who also, you know, tend to have a, a good experience inside the hospital. So, you know, you know how the hospital works, you know, kind of what the demands are on, on physician schedules. That's comforting to know that they're, you know, going out of their way to put into place a chief medical officer that has an extensive background in uh, being a physician <laughs> actively. <laughs> well, you know, it really is helpful to get to get a, a broad background. And, and mm-hmm. you know, again, I think that as, um, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, as you get CEOs that, that uh, you know, come into the hospital, they, mm-hmm. they certainly have their perspective, but, you know, sometimes it's helpful to get a medical perspective as yeah. well. Yeah, I agree. Um, tell me about when you were practicing. How was that? It was, you know, it 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 was um, it was a great experience, and yeah. I'm glad I did it. And you know, I, I after having gone to medical school, and then I did I was did a surgical residency. I did mm-hmm. three years of research along the way as well, and and then um, went into uh, you know I joined a big group practice when I was in Boston, uh-huh. and thought you know that oh well you know it'll be great because I'll have all this yeah. back you know I, so I showed up the first day and they said oh you're on call here's <laughs> there's <laughs> here's the keys to the locker room and uh, you know don't, good luck <laughs> well you you can call us but calling is a sign of weakness <laughs> welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and good luck. <laughs> yeah, and then I went to uh, so I went to the um, to the surgeon's lounge that day, and I sat down, and and uh, one of the surgeons came in. He said, "Well, this is where you're going to be for the next 35 years of your life." And you know, oh and, wow, and I was like, "Well, <laughs> that's promising, that's kind of depressing." <laughs> but but uh, but it was you know it was um, it was uh, you know, and I think a lot of surgeons and a lot of doctors in general they get to the place where they want to be, and they're perfectly happy. And I've always been somebody who kind of um, looks for more. You know, has been contented just, um, uh, you know, trying to find different things and yeah. you know look for different things. But my introduction was actually better than one of my partners there. One of my partners, they you know, he was very kind of high strung and uh-huh. tight, and so he showed <laughs> up, and and they started you know. They, they all kind of all the in the operating room. They kind of got together and they said, "Well, you know." In the operating well, room, well, you know, the, the staff there. <laughs> you know, it, it, they said, you know, one of the guys said, "Well, geez, you look a little yellow," you know. And oh boy, by, by the end of the day, they had him convinced he was jaundiced <laughs> and they, that he was going to the ER to get his labs checked. And <laughs> so, yeah, poor I mean, guy. <laughs> Yeah, they, they, uh, yeah. So I guess overall it was not that bad of an introduction I, that I, I had. I guess they so. really prepared you well, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you're, you, you've got history in Boston, you've got history in Dallas. I have to ask New England Patriots or Dallas Cowboys? I need, I need to know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll always be a Patriots fan. So. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, I lived in Dallas for a long time, and I just never could get into the whole pay, the Cowboys thing. Yeah, so, I agree. So. There you go. And my wife's New a big Tom Brady fan. So. New England Pats <laughs> fan right here, guys. <laughs> so your wife's a Tom Brady fan. That's not uh, surprising. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Tom Brady fan. Uh I'm having a moment right now. I can't remember all the names, but Julian Edelman yes, and uh, Judy and Julian Amandola Edelman, Amandola, and, uh, the Gronk, yeah. the Gronk. <laughs> Not so much the Gronk. Maybe for the younger crowd, but yeah, Amandola, Tom Brady. Yeah, yeah, I'm a fan. <laughs> so, um, Florida Medical Center. Mm-hmm. You said that that's off of Turnpike and. Between it's, Sunrise it, and Commercial. It's right between Sunrise and Commercial. It's mm-hmm. right on Oakland Park Boulevard. Mm-hmm. So um, it's it, right. Is it a larger hospital? Like how many beds? Would well, you say we're they're... licensed for 459. We run somewhat smaller than that. So um, uh, we do have the, the ability to expand. And, and really, we've been growing a lot of programs there. And so uh-huh. it's, you know, it's really been kind of an exciting time for us. Uh, it, I think the hospital, you know, since I've been there a little over two years, and it's really been uh, in a real positive transition. Yeah. 
And tell me, what is Florida Medical Center known for? I know that you guys were named the leader in uh, healthcare for. Yeah, so we were we were named a leader in healthcare equality for, by the uh, by the uh, human rights campaign. The, um, basically, you get a perfect if you get a perfect score on your your uh, equality index, then uh-huh. you you can be recognized as a leader. And there's only two um, hospitals in in Broward County uh, and. 10 in Florida that were recognized uh, That's as great. such. So really it's it's um, one of the important things is is for us to provide access to patients. And so um, there's a whole lot of barriers that people run into when they, you know, when they try to access healthcare and, and you know, really, uh, you know, with all the healthcare debates, we see that there's a lot of, you know, financial barriers that people yeah. don't want to go because they have big co-pays right. or big, you know. Um, Especially and, now with yeah, and, insurance. And then, you know, and then there's the the medical side of things. People don't want to go because they, you know, they don't want their doctor to tell them, you know, all the things they're doing wrong. I was just reading an article that said that, you know, there's a lot of women don't want to go to the doctor if they gain weight because they don't want, you know, they don't they, want to they hear it. Get, they don't want to hear it. So, <laughs> so they avoid going to the doctor. So I can appreciate that. <laughs> so, so you know, and I think we all don't want to, you know, we all. You know, nobody's perfect, and so we all have reasons why we don't want to go to the doctor. Right. But then there's a whole other group of social issues of, as to why people don't want to go to the doctor. So like, it's, well, I mean, for what, you know, like me, for example, well, uh, you know, we have a large, um, Haitian Creole population in our, right. in our area. And so the demographics of that, you know, if there's language barriers, if you, mm, if you don't speak yeah. the language, if culturally, if you don't, you know, feel comfortable, then, then all those things can, you know, be a problem. Now, the same is true when we talk about LGBTQ mm-hmm. issues where there's people that, that, don't feel comfortable accessing health care. And, and in fact, you know, we see things that, you know, the, the suicide rates and death rates for misdiagnosis or lack of diagnosis is higher, um, that people, you know, have untreated issues because they don't feel comfortable. Some people don't feel comfortable going and talking to their doctor because they feel like there's barriers. So a lot of what we want to do is to try and make health care accessible. And mm-hmm. so, you know, a lot of that become, it comes from education. We want to be able to... to educate our employees, make them feel comfortable, educate patients and visitors to know that they're coming into a welcoming environment. And so yeah. really to be recognized as a leader in healthcare equality really comes down to, to four separate areas that we have to comply with. And so really we had to make sure our policies uh, and guidelines for patients and visitors was that we, you know, had a, had a um, satisfactory uh, policies in terms of being tolerant being accepting of all communities, um, mm-hmm. and uh, then having employees who are, are uh, you know, that we had policies for employees that we, you know, recognized uh, uh, domestic partnerships of same-sex couples, yeah. recognized that we, you know, our health care would cover um, transition of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for sexual transition if, yeah. if for gender reassignment, um, and then uh, education, Part of the piece is education where we had to go out and make sure that, you know, starting with our leadership, that they go undergo training to, in terms of um, uh, making sure that they're attuned to the issues that, you know, that sometimes come up. You know, and, and a lot of it comes up in terms of, um, uh, you know, being able to use the, the pronoun that the patient prefers, you know, things like that yeah. where, where you don't necessarily think about it and you're you're so used to looking at a face sheet and saying it says male or female and, and you know, not asking yeah. and saying, you know, really, we want to make people as comfortable as possible within the, you know, we're running a hospital and we want to be able to get done what we need to be done, but we don't need to be rulesy just to be rulesy. So if they want to, you know, have certain things that, you know, in terms of how they... Uh, you know, keep up their appearance or whatnot, uh-huh. then then we want to be as tolerant as possible in terms of how we approach that. Kudos to you, because everyone deserves good health care. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah, so that's that's great. How often would you say your staff has to undergo training um, to keep up? Well, we, we're planning on doing it on an ongoing basis uh-huh. now because it's really, you know, it, it's really the same issues that we face, you know, culturally in terms of, you know, our patient populations, we face with employees. So it, employees I'm really sure. come from a vast, vast, you know, vastly different backgrounds in yeah. terms of their experience and their biases and perceptions. And so really it's it's really breaking down those barriers and really making it so that we can, um, you know, all of 
all all of our employees are attuned to you know the issues that come up and mm-hmm. and so we you know we have to do re-education at times or right. you know the issues will come up and and really it's it's um you know really breaking down those those uh you know kind of preconceived notions and, yeah and then um the other area is is you know in terms of is, that we really focus on is community outreach in terms of working with our partners in the in the um in the um in the neighborhood um and you know certainly we have we're right down the street from wilton manors and wilton manors has mm-hmm. is a large uh lgbtq population beautiful town and so i love I, wilton well manors. that's where it's I live, a gorgeous so. <laughs> town <laughs> so that's uh, that was uh, you know so i was involved in the community there as well and and uh um, so we've we've worked closely with the Pride Center at Equality Park, and oh, great. you know been involved in the the Stonewall uh, parade, and and uh, we do frequent uh, uh, lectures at the at the Pride Center. So we, we're very engaged with the community That's and, wonderful. and really trying to you know we want to make as many people as possible want to come to our hospital yeah. and, and really you know be you know feel like they're welcomed and and I think that you know for us part of our you know, growth as a hospital has been trying to encourage encourage people to come there electively rather than, you know, our, our ER is always going to be a front door to a hospital, but we want to make people welcome to come there for, you know, for whatever tests they need or whatever procedures. Yeah. Or if they do happen to come through the ER, I feel like that they're, you know, come to the right place. Yeah, that's great that you're going the extra mile to make the effort to make everyone feel comfortable to come for whatever it is that they need. Yeah. So, how often are you at the hospital? Do you live there when you're not in Wilton <laughs> Manors? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's um, it 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 tends to be a twenty four seven job. So even if I'm not in the hospital, you know, I tend to be available for you know any issues that come up. But mm-hmm. but uh, my you know overall my schedule a little bit more normal than than when I was you know doing trauma call yeah. or, or call. Um, you know, at night and, sure. and on weekends, and so the the schedule it, it's just as unpredictable. But mm-hmm. but uh, it tends to be you know a lot of the, a lot of the issues are things that we can you know kind of strategize and handle by phone. So. Yeah, that's great. So basically, you're working from when you open your eyes to when you close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, you had mentioned you stay in Wil- Wilton Manors. That's mm-hmm. your town. What do you like to do out there for fun, not work, <laughs> for fun? Yeah, so, well, we live right on, on um, the river there, and uh-huh. so, you know, kayaking and, and yeah. uh, um, you know, there's there's just so many activities to do there mm-hmm. where we can go, um, you know, right within a stone's throw. And, and, you know, coming from Texas where everything was, uh, you know, half an hour away to yeah. even go to the store, it's so just vast it's so out there. refreshing to... to um, you know, to be right there. Yeah. And then we're, you know, uh, my, bo- my boys are both, both race sailboats. And so that oh, was wow. one of the reasons why we ended up in South Florida. Cause we were, we were mo- you know, coming, um, from Dallas to e- the East coast, either to new England or to Florida, to Miami so often that, uh, for their sailing. So, yeah. you know, having moved to, uh, to Fort Lauderdale makes it a whole lot easier. Yeah, I'm sure. I we I, actually Dr. Hirsch that was on here before we were talking about how everyone who most everyone who lives down here has such an active lifestyle because there's never really an off season here. You know, it's just so beautiful all the time of the year. So sailing is a uh, beautiful sport. I oh, love no, it. Yeah. I admire it. It's gorgeous. Um, where do they do that? Well, they do it mostly um, at. Uh, uh, down in uh, Coconut Grove, so at the Beautiful. U.S. Sailing Center down there, Gorgeous. and it's really it's a great place for the the kind of boats that they sail. Uh-huh. And then uh, my uh, my uh, older son is actually he's going to go sail in iron. Well, he's going to college ostensibly, but I think sailing is probably a priority yeah. for him. But he's going to Ireland next year to, a, to Dublin. So that's great. So he's you know it's a great opportunity. But part of it is that you know they met so many. Of their friends sailing and mm-hmm. and uh, you know they know people from all over the world so yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a great sport for them to to be involved with but yeah. it's it's also so we tend to be on the water so I never end up going to the beach. I'm like, <laughs> like, oh, do you go to the beach? I'm like, I think I've been to the beach once since I moved to Florida. Yeah, so, so you're always on, but you're always on the water. Always on the water, never on the beach. Never so. on the beach. Well, that's so. great. I don't have anything against that. I love boating. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, along with everybody else in South Florida, I'm sure. 
So um, with Florida Medical Center, you guys are the leaders in providing healthcare mm-hmm. equally. Mm-hmm. And what else do you guys specialize in there? What, are, what else so are you known for? So what we're primarily known for is um, we've always been a uh, com- uh, we've been a, a stroke center for a long time, a okay. comprehensive stroke center. So in terms of doing neuro interventions, having yeah. neurologists and neurosurgeons available. Mm-hmm. So um, really, we've got great great results and and really a great response time with our door to needle. Um, so when somebody comes in and they potentially have a stroke, mm-hmm. it time is brain cells. So the longer they go with an occlusion in their brain, um, the more damage is done. So getting somebody to a hospital where they can do basically a full range of, of uh, capabilities and get their their blood supply open to their brain as quick as possible is really you know imperative. So when people come in, the first thing that they look to do is, is um, to evaluate the patient and see if they need to get TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, which is mm-hmm. a blood clot um, thinner. So basically people who come in and, and have a blood clot could get, um, you know, could get TPA. Mm-hmm. Or if they have a larger occlusion, sometimes mm-hmm. they need to get um, uh, a neuro intervention where they would mm-hmm. go in and fish the blood clot out of their artery. So, so yeah. you know, the, the quicker we can get that done yeah. and both with with both getting them to the TPA or the intervention, you know, our, we've had great time. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize, for you guys listening and watching at home, uh, neurointerventionalist is, is different from just a neurologist or an intensivist. Uh, interventionalist, you have to be really fully equipped to be able to handle those types of cases. Uh, and the provider also has to go to school for so many more years. Um, so it's pretty crucial I would say that uh, you guys have everything you need to be able so, to do yeah, that. So we've got now we've got a neurointerventionalist who's primarily based at our mm-hmm. hospital. We've got a neurosurgeon, you know, readily available, mm-hmm. and so really, you know, everything you could ever need in terms of you know those kind of interventions, we can get on on very quick order. That's great, Dr. Frank Wittenberger with Florida Medical Center. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us at home. Have a good evening, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you for letting us share with you a longer and healthier lifestyle. If you have a doctor or are a doctor and wish to be on the show, call Amp2TV at 866-244-5422, and we will put you on the air as soon as possible. Tune in next week for more information on living longer and having a healthier life. The opinions expressed on the preceding sponsored program were strictly those of its hosts, guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the station, its staff, management, or sponsors.